like working. May I suggest that anyone uh, 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 who is as hard of hearing as I am uh, might want to come and move down closer to the stage. Yeah. I think there's something happening. No, I think I think yours is working, mine is not. Well we think we can. Alright, so it's it is not a test pass if everything works. Thank you all for coming in. My name is Isha Sharaf. I am uh, gainfully employed in, the, in this institution called Intel. And uh, I'm really privileged to have uh, Max here as our key speaker for tonight. Uh, on behalf of uh, SFA ACM, uh, we are uh, we're a nonprofit organization. We call it ACM. SFA ACM chapter is probably one of the most active chapters of uh, Association of Computing Engineers. And uh, we have uh, regular talks uh, twice a month. On, uh, uh, one's on Monday, the other one's on Wednesday on uh, data science topics. And uh, this is a Wednesday's uh, data science SIG. And uh, I also am privileged to be uh, the chair for the uh, uh, professional development seminar uh, workshop. There are a number of other people from ACM today uh, aboard, so I'd like to quickly just have them raise their hand. I think we have, uh, oh, we have one friend here who is uh, my colleague as well. Uh, we have Tom, uh, Vienna, our fearless leader, president, and uh, Vienna, you can stand up and uh, say your name if I'm Okay, yeah, those ones is outside. Okay, um, all right. So today's topic is uh, why most analytics projects uh, fail and how to engage with your clients uh, successfully. Uh, Max, uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail uh, on the topic itself, but uh, a few housekeeping items first. So just a quick introduction to what ACM is. Uh, founded in uh, 1957, uh, if you guys are not aware, I was uh, Pretty surprised to know that it's a, it's a fairly old institution and uh, with the membership, if you haven't signed up uh, so far, really encourage you to do that. It's only $10 annually and you get a ton of benefits. Just the, uh, uh, the professional development seminar workshop that uh, we manage uh, several times a year comes with about uh, 20, 25 hours discount for each of those workshops. So it's, it's, it really pays off um, the front of that. Uh, and then the two monthly meetings that I talked about in terms of upcoming events, uh, uh, we have a uh, standing back uh, metal decker case study coming up, and then we have uh, quantifying the quality of life of smartphone-centric human versus human-centric methods uh, from Stanford University coming up. Those of you are fairly interested. And uh, uh, I'm actually privileged uh, to be uh, also helping with the science fair competition this year, uh, which Tom uh, has been you know, uh, championing for many, many years now. If you are at all interested in becoming a judge for the competition this year, it's very light work. You show up for one day for a few hours. You get a very nice sandwich out of it, some cookies if you are nice to me. And um, uh, you guys are pretty heartless. And you get to judge you know, some really excellent projects uh, that are geared towards the use of you know, computational uh, mechanisms, right? Cross 
doctor, a father, whatever it may be. But if you were, you know, maybe even science is just about genetics, uh, physics, math, you name it, right? So it could be applied, it could be pure, you know, software itself. So please, please reach out to me. We've got about uh, six judges. I think we could really use at least about six more um, uh, to, uh, to really make a run for it. There's, there's a lot of really good projects that you want to go through and, uh, and fight over. So there is also uh, APM Knowledge Discovery KDB uh, conference. So if you are not aware of KDB Nuggets or KDB.org, uh, there is a, a call for papers. Just reach out to me afterwards uh, and we can talk more about it. Uh, Greg Makowski actually uh, manages uh, a lot of that uh, for us. I don't think he's here tonight, uh, but we can get you more information if you're interested in that. Okay, so uh, at this point, I'll Pass uh, the steel tank microphone to you guys, and uh, please go ahead and tell us a little bit about uh, any opportunities that you have, any volunteering opportunities, um, any if you're a former so organization, you want to make any announcements, you will be and you, want uh, to if you are, you know, a startup or if you're a large company. After this, for, if you, know, you want. Yeah. Right? So yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I still have to put my computer on. But yes, uh, it's it's the right to go. Hi, I'm Greg Weinstein. For those science fiction fans out there, I thought I'd walk up here to move the stage and, and say, my name is Harry Seldon, but I don't think you really did that. <laughs> no. Yes. Uh, I tried. Uh, normally, you find a nice registration table at the front where we take care of all membership business. Unfortunately, that box did not arrive today, so uh, we'll have to catch you next time, but we really would like to have you as members. And we're a totally volunteer-run organization. Um, that 1957 date is just the date of the founding of this chapter of the ACM, which dates back to 1946. Um, we thank you all for showing up tonight. This is sort of an experiment coming at this time. Um, like any other all-volunteer-run organization, we were no volunteers. It's sort of the tautology, but uh, let me ask. Uh, we really need some volunteers, people who are interested in things like working on websites or writing um, or uh, writing articles for our newsletter or uh, helping with registration. Hmm? That's for the audience. If any of you are interested in that, please let me know. Uh, this for the camera. I'll be here for right. this for the audience. Okay, and, got it. Uh, let me You'll be okay setting up. We'll talk about maybe uh, what we can do to make this a better chapter. And if you have any ideas on talks that you might want to hear or that you can present, or if you have, if you work for companies that have any locations where we might be able to hold meetings, please come talk to one of the officers and we will uh, and we'll get some information for you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, who else wants to make any announcements? I guess Anybody? you'll want this first and then give it to me. Okay. Um, I will go ahead and introduce Max uh, before he does, but oh. uh, for opening, double opening session for Oh, sure. I'm just going to mic him up. Oh, okay. Or are you going to mic him up? Would this one work if I just use it before he's mic'd up? No. I don't know. Is it turned off? Is this on? No. No. Switch on the top. Is it on? Yeah. Is this on? Okay. First, please open your mouth. All right. So, uh, Are there any announcements? Uh, uh, anyone have any jobs that you'd like to announce? Anyone have any events that you would want to promote? Now's your chance. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, so this fine gentleman will, will introduce our speaker who I'm going to mic up. All right, so. Uh, uh, okay, I actually don't need to do this. I, do, I, I work on sound. Oh, okay, that's fine. Normally we 
have worked to reiterate why we are the Apple. Um, so if, if we're going to bring in sponsorships next time, definitely uh, talk to me as well. Or talk, I mean, talk to one of us. We can use that. OK? So no questions. All right. Now you know. Do you have master slides up there? There's computer up there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's go ahead and swap that now. Yeah. Um, sure thing. So uh, I thought I would introduce Max. I have worked with Max for about 22 years. We've been each other's closest collaborators for most of that time. And so I just thought I'd uh, get an opportunity for me to, to say a few things about him. So you I thought his move it, you just press that. Okay, if I can put it on the book here or something. So um, I thought I'd kind of an extended intervention here. How many of you were at his talk at the ACM last year? Okay, about six people, I think. So, okay, so this is what this is going to be used. Uh, same slides I had last year, but I won't go into it. I'm going to skip. But um, Max was the 2018 winner of the Ramsey Medal. And this is the highest honor given out by the Decision Analysis Society. Um, you know, since we don't have a Nobel Prize in Decision Science or Data Science, um, I've heard many people ask me, oh, this is the closest thing we have or the highest honor we have in our field. So it, it's a pretty, <laughs> pretty nice honor. And um, as you might expect, somebody with that kind of uh, reputation has a lot of accomplishment. The committee that gave the award decided these things. Steering passes to decision analysis, combination of decision analysis with artificial intelligence, the improvement of energy and environmental policy decision making, um, contribution to many application areas, education, and public awareness. I think the space bar is easier for me. So he's currently the CEO of Lumina uh, Decision Systems here in Silicon Valley. That's more than a full time job, uh, but he still has all these other titles as well. Uh, adjunct professor at Carnegie Mellon. Consulting professor at Stanford. He's on the Environmental Protection Agency Scientific Advisory Board, and he's active in the citizens' climate lobby. And back in the 90s, he was the vice president of decision technologies at Ask Jeeves. He has degrees from all of these places. Um, he did a PhD at Carnegie Mellon University in engineering and public policy, and after getting his PhD, he became a professor there. And uh, while he was a professor, he or, uh, managed to co-author the book with his advisor. It was called Uncertainty. This ended up being a very influential book, especially in public policy circles. Uh, it deals with how to represent uncertainty using probability distributions, where these come from, and how to use them for making hard decisions. Um, he also developed, during that time, the precursors to what would eventually become Analytica. And There we go. And um, eventually he felt he wanted to try applying that stuff in real world applications. So in 1991, he and a student moved out to Silicon Valley and founded Lumina. And in 96, they launched Analytica for the first time as a commercial product. Analytica has been the flagship of Lumina ever since, and it's been used by tens of thousands of data scientists and analysts in dozens of application areas uh, in over a thousand different organizations. It remains a very active product. Uh, the really impressive thing about Max are all his accomplishments he's made on many, many areas uh, while he's been leading a consulting practice at Lumina. And last year I went through <laughs> many of these in my introduction. Uh, I thought today, every one of these, by the way, just as a subsampling, and every one of these is a super impressive project that would have really been a capstone of anybody's career. And he's made out a lot of them, so it's, it's really something. I thought I'd just mention the one on the bottom right there a little bit. If you've been to Santa Barbara, you've no doubt seen these oil platforms off the coast there. And how to decommission these as these are starting to run out and reach their end of life has been a very contentious issue that you know the many environmentalists and oil companies and different interests have argued about for years. Um, so several years ago, Max and the late uh, Burke Bronstein um, got into this and they, they worked with 22 different organizations from 
environmental agencies, legal defense funds, marine biologists, fishing interests, shipping interests, coastal conservancies, the state of California, and oil companies to develop a model of the different options that would be available and what the impact would be on the various objectives that these different organizations cared about. Then provided this model to those organizations and let them play with it, understand the impacts, the advanced ramifications of things, and try out their own assumptions. And amazingly, this led to a, consent, a near consensus. 20 out of the 22 organizations came to the same conclusion about what decisions should be made, which led to legislation, new legislation being passed by the California legislature that was signed into law by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, as one of his final acts as governor. So, super accomplished, and it's been an honor working with them for at least 22 years, and we're still working together. And so I will turn it over to Max now. <laughs> well, uh, let's see, can you hear me okay? Yes. Is my, good, well, Lonnie, thank you so much. Um, really, um, you know, you might think maybe I wrote this, but actually I can prove that I didn't, because, uh, the, the last project he talked about, I'm actually going to use as an example in this talk, um, so we obviously didn't quite coordinate, but it's, and I know it's going to be kind of tough to live up to the billing that Lonnie just gave me, but anyway, we'll see what goes. So, um, So as a few of you know, I actually gave a talk here uh, almost a year ago. Um, and actually, Liana invited me and wrote a, I guess I thought I sent her an abstract, but she didn't see it and wrote a much more interesting ab abstract, or at least seemed kind of interesting. So I actually talked on that, which was on human intuition, decision analysis, and the value of information. And today, I'm going to, as you can see, what I'm going to be talking about, which was actually the original abstract that I had sent. And um, I guess uh, it must be a sucker of punishment to invite me back yet again. But anyway, I feel very honored to, to be here. Um, so first, I'd like to get a sense of uh, you know, who I'm speaking with here. Um, so I'd like you to kind of put up your hand um, as to which of these titles best describes you. There is a dot, dot, dot at the end in which you can volunteer something else, but um, analytics practitioner. Okay, so I guess about th th four. Data scientist. Okay, about six. Uh, software developer. About, I don't know, 12. You can see I'm very numerate here. Uh, a computer scientist, okay, about eight. <laughs> and uh, decision scientist, about three, four. And dot, 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 something else. You want to, anybody want to shout out like what, the, what they, who they, what they do? Anthropologist. <laughs> Thank you. How do you get project manager? Project manager. Viz dev. Viz dev, great, thanks. Analytics product manager, great, thanks. So, um, I mean, this talk is kind of aimed at, well, I guess all of those people, but particularly people who do analytics, modeling, um, decision science. Um, and, you know, I did notice a few people put up their hands more than once, which is entirely appropriate. I think I would have put up my hand for each of those and some other dot, dot, dots that I will not mention today. <laughs> um, so. Okay, so <clears throat> it won't surprise you, since you ca saw the title of my talk, that this is kind of where I'm starting. You know, most big data 
analytics projects fail, um, or at least they fail to provide real business value. So, well, first of all, I should ask, how many of you think that's true from your own experience? Okay, maybe about a third, perhaps. And how many of you think that's false, you know, from what you've seen in your own experience? Two, okay. So we have sort of a majority, but a weak majority, shall we say. So this isn't just like me mouthing off, um, although it might be that too. There, you know, Gartner Research, and uh, Gartner Research is actually just in the building across the way, I noticed. As many of you might know, they're kind of an industry research analyst. They look at the tech industry um, to see, you know, what's going on there. And in particular, they've done studies of in the last few years of you know, big data, data analytics projects at large companies for the most part. And in 2016, they estimated that 60% of the big data projects fail to provide business value. And then the next year, they revised their estimate. And they said, oops, no, we got that wrong. Uh, I think it's more like 85%. And I don't know whether the 2016 study was included as one of the failures in that 2017 study. Anyway, that's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> um, and there was an article in the Harvard Business Review, uh, which they, they looked at about 36 large companies that had major data science, data analytics initiatives over a period of time. They looked at them over a period of three years. And at the end of that time, concluded that only, well, slightly more than one in three of them had met the objectives of the analytics uh, of the, the, over, the, over that period. So, um, so and Gartner, as some of you might know, has this concept of the trough of disillusionment. So, you know, they have this curve where sometimes called the hype cycle. You know, first, and this started, what, about five, six, seven years ago, seven years ago, eight years ago, kind of big data and machine learning and so on. Suddenly, you know, huge enthusiasm. And, the and then typically, and this isn't just about data science, it's kind of whatever they're looking at, they go through kind of a trough of disillusionment. And so the question is, are we due for that now in this area? I don't know, but, um, and then what they say normally happens is if this thing pans out, which I think is pretty clear, then there's a slope of enlightenment and plateau of productivity, you know, when it just becomes a normal thing and there's not, you know, it's not, not so exciting, but it just delivers value. So maybe that's what we can expect. So, so my question is, well, if it's true that, you know, we can argue about the exact percentage, but if it's true that a lot of these projects fail to deliver business value, why is that? Yes? People are terrible estimators. <laughs> People are terrible estimators and Okay. Software development. Right. So, so you'd say it's kind of like a generalization of general software development. You know, most software projects fail or at least take way longer and more money than was estimated. So that's definitely part of it, I'm sure. Yes. I would say that, for example, failing in the software analogy, if you are proposed a software project, you can tell from the beginning it is feasible. Okay. Okay, good, good. Um, yes, so, so he's saying that, you know, with a software project, you can tell whether it's feasible. With data analytics, you don't really know if it's going to be feasible until you start to do it. I think that's an interesting point, yes. Uh, we'll only have one more. Yes. 
Well, <clears throat> so fail to deliver business value. So I guess what that means is that, you know, the business side, the people that are trying to, you know, make decisions, at least that's the way I look at it, trying to get insights and make decisions from the, the analysis of the data, feel that it didn't really help. I think that, that's the criterion. So, and anyway, the, the reason that Gartner gives is, you know, management resistance and internal politics. Okay, good. Thank you. So, so we have confirmation here from somebody in the trenches that that's what happens and that a lot of people are too afraid to actually say that is what's going on. And the Harvard Business Review study basically said something similar. Insufficient organizational alignment, lack of middle management adaption, adoption, understanding, and business resistance. So I'm sure that this is true in terms of you know, what's going on, perception, especially from the data analytics groups. But I kind of have a concern about this. So you know, I've been, a, as Lonnie mentioned, I've been kind of a consultant, among other things, for quite a long time. A decision analyst, I guess I like to call myself. And it's not uncommon that I feel that my client is like a little bit obtuse and their organization is a bit dysfunctional and like how come they don't appreciate our advice. But when I start to feel that, I remind myself, well, you know, my job as a consultant is to help these people, help this organization make better decisions. And if they don't find my advice useful, well, whose fault is that? Really, it's mine. Um, you know, I need to understand the world from that perspective and provide the information or the analysis, um, the tools that are really gonna help them. Uh, and, you know, complaining that they don't really understand the wonderful analysis that I've done really is kind of, um, you know, how far is that gonna get me? So, so, you know, my question is, should we be blaming our clients for this? Um, and conversely, how can we provide real value to our clients? And um, so, so my thesis is that it's really about engaging more effectively with our clients. And, and I'm gonna talk a bit about, well, what I mean by engaging, what kind of tools are available, what kind of methods can help this work more effectively. And I'm going to illustrate it with a couple of examples. The first one that Lonnie mentioned, uh, decommissioning California's offshore oil platforms, and also a little bit on a project we did for the Department of Energy over 10 years, developing models for looking at the future of the automobile fleet in the US, and wh what kind of policies might affect adoption of new technologies like electric vehicles, um, biofuels, hydrogen, and so on. So first thing, I probably should say a word about what I mean by client. So um, ultimately, somebody who's making decisions that matter, that you are hopefully trying to help. And Oftentimes that might be your boss or senior executives at your organization, or if you're a consulting company, you know, your consulting clients at other organizations. And it could be one person, but usually it's a team of people. Um, even if there's like one senior executive, maybe a CEO who's ultimately making the decision, there is a whole team of other people that works with him or her, um, stakeholders and so on that care about it, that probably have a lot of input if that CEO is paying attention. And, it, or if you're building a decision support tool, um, it could be, you know, end users. Or it could actually be you 
if you are you know, doing some analysis for yourself. And I strongly advise doing that. There's nothing like being your own client that helps you think about what clients think about the analysis and like what makes results useful or not. So, um, so <coughs> this, this slide is really kind of, in a certain sense, encapsulates the core part of the message. Yes? Yes. Is the data you're talking about only text data or also voice data and video data? Um, it's any kind of data. Voice, you know, numbers, text. I mean, whatever it is that is available that you can analyze that is relevant to the problem at hand. And actually, that relevance part of it is kind of the, a core part of the issue very, in many cases. Because, um, you know, a company increasingly has humongous amounts of data, but then they want to help make a decision about whether to launch a new product or buy a company. And the question is, how much of the data they have is really going to help them? Sometimes it is relevant, but um, that's kind of a question. Um, and I'm not going to be talking a lot about kind of the practice of analytics in terms of, you know, whether you should be using conventional statistics, machine learning, um, or, you know, I'm going to take it that you guys already know about that really well. That's, and that's really important, really interesting to me, uh, uh, but that's not what I'm going to be focusing on today. I'm going to be focusing about, well, the relationships. Okay, so what do I mean? So there's the world. Okay, the world is infinitely complicated. But our models, even if we have humongous amounts of data, are extremely simple, and we can only model small bits of the world. And so there's a relationship between the world. You know, it might be our company, the business environment it's working in, um, it might be a physical system, whatever it is, and some kind of model built around data, ideally but also built around human intelligence. Um, you know, wh what do we, how do we think the world works? We might build systems dynamics models. We might do decision analysis based partly on expert judgment, not just on data. But, okay, there's something missing. So first, the analyst. That's me or you, um, maybe a team that's looking at the world, trying to figure out what's in it, look at the data, building a model. And there's something critical missing here, when you can guess what that is right now. The client, again, could be your boss, could be an actual consulting client. And the relationship, the engagement between you as analyst and, and the client. And you'll see this analyst um, is kind of looking at his computer, definitely not looking out there at his client or at us. You know, he's kind of like, well, kind of like me and probably quite a few of you. He's kind of a, a geek. I mean, if you hope you won't be too offended if I use that word. Um, but we have to become empaths. That is somebody that can get inside the head of our client and try to think about the way they look at the world. And for some of us, that's kind of challenging. I mean, I would say it, it was for me when I started out in this. Um, but I found it interesting and worked at it. And so I think the good news is, although I've been criticized for saying this, but I think that for people who have mastered kind of the hard skills of you know, numbers and equations and math and software, um, can uh, learn these soft skills, and arguably what I've been criticized for is saying it's actually a bit easier for us than the other way around. Um, anyway, so, so that's kind of the main point here. But I'm going to go into a few um, particular methods, that, technical methods, tools in, in, in large part, that we can use to help this process of engagement. 
So I'm going to use what this example from controversy to consensus, which is this project that Lonnie mentioned of how to um, decommission California's offshore oil platforms. And there's 27 of these platforms off the coast of Southern California. Some of you might have seen them off Santa Barbara or LA. Um, and they're at the end of their lives. They aren't producing gas or oil much anymore. And the original leases said that the oil companies have to remove them entirely when they're done. And so we were asked um, part, as part of a team to kind of put together some analysis, not really recommendations, but analyze the options and look at the science and economics and engineering and law, marine biology and so on, and try to put that together. And here's a map of where you see those blue dots and red dots. Those are the offshore oil platforms. Uh, they look small there. Uh, a few of you might have been around in 1969 when there was this massive oil spill, which was kind of the deep water horizon of its day um, in 1969, which is part of the reason that anything to do with offshore oil in California is extremely controversial, even for those that don't remember this hideous event. And the other thing to know is that these things are really, really huge. And what you see there is just the tip of the iceberg, kind of literally, because underwater they have this structure, in many cases a thousand foot long. This is part of Platform Harmony before it was installed. And if you can see, like, there's a crane here. And anyway, it's, it's big. So getting these things out is kind of expensive. Um, and they kind of look like this. So I don't know if any of you are divers, but you know, divers actually, it's, it's quite a popular to go and dive the rigs because under them they're coated with marine life, uh, coral and shellfish, and you know, then fish come and breed there, and then the sea lions come and eat the fish, and then the humans come and watch what's going on. So it's quite a world there. But you can imagine like taking out one of those structures when it's got a, another 18 inches of marine uh, a crust encrustation is kind of challenging. So, okay, so I talked about a team of stakeholders, our clients. So our immediate client for this was the California Ocean Science Trust, um, but they basically served a kind of coordinating role among all the different stakeholders. So there's a bunch of government agencies like the California Natural Resources Agency, um, the operators like Chevron of some of the platforms, um, commercial sport fishing interests, um, environmental groups that are very concerned about this, um, and recreational divers, both human and otherwise, who have strong opinions on the topic. Um, so, so, okay, so I'm just kind of going into this particular example to kind of flesh out like some of the issues in a kind of concrete way. But, and you know, you, your clients may be, you know, your senior execs in your company perhaps. Um, maybe they don't have sea lions in their stakeholder group, but I'm sure there's people that, you know, shout occasionally, hopefully not, but uh, you know, it, and some of the issues can be quite complex and, and controversial. So first step, which is, sounds like way too simple to be even worth mentioning, you know, ask questions and listen. And so <coughs> about 20 years ago, I asked uh, this guy that worked for a large utility company that shall remain nameless, um, the stupid consultant question, what keeps you up at night? And he said, hey, nothing keeps me up at night. I work for a utility. <coughs> so that was then. I don't think they feel the same way nowadays, <laughs> especially not around here. Um, so, so, but, you know, active listening. Probably many of you are aware, you know, you ask your client 
what they care about, what they're looking for, what decisions they're thinking about, what they're hoping to get out of the project. And you restate to them what you just heard. Um, that's kind of active listening to make sure they understand what that you un they know that you understood what they said, or if you didn't, they'll correct you. And look at nonverbal cues as well. You know, is this something they really care about? Is there maybe a hidden thing that they're not quite being explicit about that maybe you need to dig for? Um, you know, don't assume that your clients, first of all, know exactly what they want. I mean, you want to ask them what they want, but sometimes part of the job is helping them figure out what's possible what you could provide that they, they, you might be able to provide stuff that they, that is actually more useful than they thought you could do, but you have to explain that to them. Or maybe they think you can provide something that you actually can't provide. Again, something you need to explain. So, um, so, and this is typically, well, one model of consulting is, okay, I go to my client Ask him or her, what, you know, what do you need? When do you need it? How much resources are there? Okay, you go away, you know, crunch the data, come back with some graphs and charts and maybe a report and a PowerPoint, you know, a few months later, and that's it. Okay. I mean, I'm caricaturing, and I'm sure you all know that's not really how things work. It needs to be an iterative process, so there's like, clients, there may be a group of clients, and a, often a group of people on the analytics team. And to work effectively, there needs to be kind of constant interaction through a series of stages. I mean, they may or may not have the names that here, but, but the key point is that it's an interactive process, because it's only through that ongoing decision dialogue that you really understand what they care about and they really understand what you can provide and hopefully converge on something useful. So um, these questions are things that I borrowed from this book, Asking is Better Than Telling, uh, from Catherine Rosbeck, which I found quite useful. Um, kind of engage, you know, first, well, what's your organization's biggest problem, um, that kind of thing. How could analytics contribute? Then explore, what are the objectives? What decisions could the analytics inform? And what are the key uncertainties? And you'll see these nodes, if you haven't seen them before, have a conventional shape from influence diagrams, and I'll get into that in more detail. Um, so I'm kind of a bit literal-minded, so when I hear about dashboards, I like, oh, okay, a dashboard. So here's a dashboard. Okay, so I'm gonna making a point here that some of you will find obvious, but some of you might have seen, but I think some of you probably will see that it's kind of deeper than it, than it appears at first. So, okay, here's the dashboard. We have a rear view mirror, okay? And our descriptive analytics are all about analyzing the data that we have. And the data that we have is only from the past. I mean, we haven't yet figured out how to get data from the future. Um, <coughs> I think there's a, well, well. So, so, and the thing is, if you spend all your time on focusing on data from the past, like, you're not really seeing where you're going. So, you know, maybe you have a GPS, you know, predictive analytics that can help you forecast the future based on various forecasting techniques, maybe systems dynamics modeling, maybe various things. There's still something kind of missing from this car, and it's not autonomous, by the way. I mean, so, I mean, pretty obvious, okay? So, this is only interesting both the rear view mirror stuff and the GPS is only useful if we're gonna do something with it, like decide where we're gonna to drive to. And that's what I call decision analytics. So it's only, so analytics, just to really kind of belabor the point, analytics have no value. 
until they help you make a better decision. I mean, they might be interesting, you might get some insights, but until it informs a decision, like, you know, what's the point? It's kind of depressing in the end for us. I mean, some of us really enjoy doing the analytic stuff and generating cute graphs. I mean, I think I enjoy that. But ultimately, like, if no one is really, like, making a change, uh, making a decision based on it, you know, why are we doing this? And so we have descriptive analytics. Um, you know, in the oil, in the oil platform case, you can think about, well, if you're trying to estimate the cost of removing those oil platforms, um, you can look at places they've done it before in the Gulf of Mexico. But California is different, regulatory different, water is deeper, and you have to get the crane barges all the way around South America to bring them here from the North Sea and or wherever they are right now. Kind of, so everything is a little bit different. So you can't just take that data, you have to adjust it. And that's where the predictive analytics comes in. Okay, how do we adjust it? Um, and the decision analytics, you know, ultimately, how will this help us better make decisions? So, for example, I mean, this is kind of what ended up happening in this example. Uh, instead of completely removing the platform, which is what the lease is required, so it required a change in the law, consider leaving the support structure with its teeming band of fish and marine life in place, but just cut off the top so it's not a hazard to ship it. Um, so I sh showed you those node types, um, objective, decision, uncertainty, and data. So those are the elements of a decision of an influence diagram. Actually, we added data. The decision analysts that came up with these didn't really you do that, but it's kind of important. Um, and here's a kind of example for a simple uh, model when trying to price a product, decide on its marketing budget. Those are the green decision rectangles. And there's some intermediate variables. Um, there's an objective net present value, which we're trying to maximize. Perhaps you have a more sophisticated measure of value with multiple objectives. Um, the arrows are influences. It just says, okay, that variable depends on these others. And at this level, it's purely qualitative. Um, but we can draw this up, these diagrams up with our clients, and even you know, fairly non-quantitative people can easily understand what this diagram means and, and contribute to it. Say, well, hey, there's another decision you haven't got in here. There's another uncertainty you need to put in there. So it's some, it's a representation that you can use with a variety of people and also technical people in kind of structuring like the things that your client cares about and is interested in. And you can dig down into the modules and there might be sub diagrams. And uh, in this case, the ovals are chance variables, things, numbers that you're uncertain about that you have to estimate, maybe from data, maybe from expert judgment. And influence diagrams were developed by decision analysts originally just for, as kind of tools for graphic facilitation. So you can sit around a computer with a group and you know, try to figure out, okay, well, what needs to be in this? And um, because of the node shape reminds you that you have to identify each node. Well, is this a decision? Is this something that we, my company, or decision maker can change? Or is it an uncertainty which is like we don't have direct control over it? And oddly enough, that distinction is really quite challenging to make sometimes. I mean, think about, you know, for an electric power company, is the price of electricity their decision? Well, it's clearly not, you know, as a rate payer, my decision. Well, if you know anything about the regulatory structure, it's kind of a little 
unclear exactly who makes those decisions. It's kind of a process. Um, but the goal of this exercise is to build a shared representation, a shared understanding of the things that matter, um, the things that are uncertain, the decisions, the objectives, with your clients so that, and you can draw this up together and um, you know, it, it's, it takes a little bit of practice to learn how to do it, but in the basic concepts are pretty intuitive. And it's, and even if some of the node, I mean, later on we may go back and put in quantitative models underlying each of the relations. Maybe probability distributions, maybe conditional dependency, maybe just simple accounting relations. Um, maybe whole computer programs. But you know, that's what we do as analysts. But if we started out with a representation that we've shared with our client, then we can get a lot further. So here's an example of a top level diagram that we put together for the oil rig issue. So the vertical column is uh, eight um, at what decision analysts call attributes, really objectives or things that people care about. Not everybody cares about them the same amount, but they represent the things that collectively all the stakeholders care about, at least some of them. And then there's the, the decommissioning options, so the decisions. So here we've just represented it in a kind of very abstract, a single green rectangle, but we can open it up and see, okay, there's a whole decision tree inside of here. We could do complete removal, like the leases require, and then there's various options about how we do the removal. You know, we can use explosions, we, where do we dispose it, and so on and so on. And then, or we could leave it in place. You know, maybe we could reuse these platforms and put wind turbines on them. That would be kind of cool, because we're taking these monuments to uh, fossil fuels and making them into renewables. Unfortunately, it didn't quite pan out technically and economically, but. And then there's kind of the intermediate option, partial removal, you chop the top off and leave the rest. So, you know, this is just a very specific example of structuring some decisions. You know, yours might be quite different, but I think you get the picture of how you might do that. And then I'm gonna dig into one of these others, the economic cost. So each of these things we can dig into, but not today. Um, and there's an influence diagram here that we put together working with a oil rig engineer who understands the costs of deconstructing or de uh, decommissioning these things. And we sat down with him. Well, I didn't, but uh, one of my staff did spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out all the components and how to put it together. So, and we, uh, 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 Luminar, our analytical software, actually uses these influence diagrams as its primary representation for structuring models and for navigating and documenting them. And this is an example of a model uh, for the A-team thing that I mentioned, looking at long-range automobile policy for the US. This was kind of back when we had an administration that was interested in policies like this. Well, maybe they're still interested, just in the other direction. Um, and it looked at the auto US automobile fleet and said, well, there's this kind of turnover. If people adopt electric vehicles or hydrogen at this rate, well, first of all, what would determine that? And then what effect would that have on greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, certainly no longer of interest to some people, and um, costs of transportation and oil and gas imports or exports. So we can, this is actually the top level of a hierarchical module. Here is his kind of part of that hierarchy. We can kind of dig into that module and then dig into the next module and so on. And within that, there's a model with you know, several thousand variables but at the top level, it's something that the policy folks can understand and relate to and have input to. Or hopefully, even inside, if they want to go to that level of detail. And it provides 
kind of a clarity of documentation of the structure that uh, is kind of missing from typical, you know, if you write it in Python or, or Fortran or whatever. So, okay. So one of the hardest questions when you're doing analytics and modeling is like how much time to put into it? How complex should it be? So I'm kind of curious if anybody wants to volunteer, like from, their exper from your experience, you know, how do you make that decision? What determines when you're doing some analytics work, you know, how much detail you go into? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the value of the problem that you're solving, right, how much value could it provide if it works out well? That's a great answer. Thank you. Yes. How much time you have left? Yes. I think that's a very practical answer that most of us can relate to. Yes. It depends on your audience. Absolutely. You know, who's your client? What do they care about? One more. Yes. So does your, you want to make sure that your model captures all the basic drivers, the, the key things. I mean, the problem is the world is infinitely complex, and we have to leave a lot out, well, huge amount out. And we can only put a small amount in. Yes. Sorry? You might need some extra experts, yeah. yeah. And then, right, can you find the right expert? Yeah. So anyway, here's a f you know, few answers I've got for this. You know, how much data do you have? What is, how complex is the problem? Um, the amount of uncertainty, and this is interesting, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, the power of your tools, you know, and your computers, you know, do you have a massive cluster of, you know, supercomputer available to you, your computational resources, human resources, you know, how much time do you have? We can relate to that. And, you know, what's needed to make a decision? That's kind of an important one. And um, the main point I want to make here is that this green rectangle model size is a I put it as a decision variable. It's like our, as analysts, as data scientists, as decision scientists, it's our decision variable. We get to decide that at least, uh, you know, we might need to talk about the resources with our clients. And it's not, you know, it, I, I think those decisions are often not made in a very conscious way and I think that often ends up with problems. So, so there's a few um, wise men who have uh, opined on this topic. Um, so Einstein famously said, or is supposed to have said, a theory should be as simple as possible, but no simpler, which is you know, really cute and cool. But of course, it kind of leaves a little bit unstated about how you figure out like what as simple as possible really means, which is kind of what we're trying to get at. And then there's John Muir, who some of you might know as a naturalist who uh, was instrumental in founding Yosemite and Muir Woods and so on. And he has this wonderful quote, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it's hitched to everything else in the universe. And that's kind of what makes our life so difficult because, you know, there are, you know, we are always going to be leaving out a lot of connections in our analysis and models. And that's just, you know, that's our job, leaving stuff out, basically. But hopefully, you know, keeping in the stuff that matters. And that's the question. So um, there's another guy, uh, Cecil Northcutt Parkinson, who's not so famous nowadays, but he was like, a very well-known early management theorist who was asked, you know, for a government agency or a company, you know, 
how many people work there and how many people need to work there? And his, he says, well, Parkinson's law, work expands to fill the time available. And I think this is kind of, I have a corollary to that law, which I think applies to computer models, which is computer models ex expand, exhaust the computer and human resources available. And you know, when I look at the size of a lot of models, that's kind of pretty much the criterion that's used for deciding on, on how large they are. And I'm, I mean, you've probably all had this experience, like, you know, well, those of you who've been around for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, remember that computers were like, you know, not that powerful in those days. Every project we do seems to require just a little bit more than our current cycles computers can handle. And then, like, two years later, they're, you know, twice as much, or you know, 10 years later there, I forget what the number is, but, you know, and somehow they're still not enough. I mean, why is that? You know, that's not, that's because we're using this criterion, which is really not necessarily the right one. So what should we be doing? Okay, so, so those of you that are software developers are very familiar with agile software development. And agile analytics is really kind of a similar concept, probably somewhat familiar to many of you. And that, but I think if one thinks about it more, this kind of really is a major part of the answer here. So, you know, we start out by briefly defining our needs, working with our client, figuring out their objective. I mean, it still might be an in-depth conversation with our clients, but not exhaustive requirement setting. You know, that went out with the waterfall method. Build a rapid prototype that at least works and gives you some insight, maybe. Maybe the insight as to why that is insufficient, or maybe turns out a simple prototype is enough. Test it with your client and also do sensitivity analysis to figure out, okay, well, I made these assumptions here. What if I changed them? How much if difference would that have? Now, that's something that you can't do with conventional software for the most part. But if you're doing analytics and modeling, that's really, really valuable. And so it's really great to be able to, to do that. With a quantitative modeling package, you should be able to. And then obviously, based on those insights, like what your client thinks of it, you know, is it missing some crucial things? Is it, are the new decisions that need to be in there? And your sensitivity analysis, identifying which uncertainties or which assumptions really make a difference, that guides you into where to expand it. And the thing is, our intuition, including my own, is like not good about knowing what is going to matter in a model. Well, that's my experience. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know, you know, user interface designers, like, they go into the profession with lots of ideas about what makes a good user interface. If they've been around for a while and they're paying attention, they discover that you learn a whole lot more by experiments than you do by, you know, from your expectations, you know, evidence-based software development, if you like. And, you know, iterate until your clients are satisfied or, you know, it may be still till you run out of time. But the good thing is that if you take the iterative pros, you already have a, de a fairly decent model by the time you run out of time. Whereas if you only are still on the first cycle when you run out of time, you're hosed. Okay, so here's an example of a sensitivity analysis for those that might not be familiar. Sometimes this, there's many ways of doing sensitivity analysis. This is kind of a simple way, sometimes called a tornado chart, which may or may not be obvious from what it looks like. So this is an example from the platform decommissioning model. There's a whole bunch of parameters down the left side of the graph. These are uncertain quantities. In this case, mostly like how much different people care about different objectives. And 
you take them from a low possible value to a high possible value to see um, what the difference is. This is looking at the difference between partial removal and complete removal, two main decisions we were looking at. Yes? So a lot of those kind of stuff is probably necessary to arrive at the point that uh, some of the analysis is assumptions, but you don't have enough data to focus on the data in order to go on and have all the variables necessary to make a decision. Yes. Um, <clears throat> well, I think there's maybe two pieces to that. Yes. So how do, you, how do you know that you've got all the variables? And is it also all the data that you might need? Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's no simple way that I know to do that. But, um, but you know, going through this agile iterative process will you'll learn as you go through it, hopefully, what, you know, where you're missing stuff that turns out to be important. Um, yes. Sure. Right. So, so, right. so you're looking at the success metrics and yeah. um, so, yes, I mean, that's important. We, we, we're, we, we need to be defining our objectives very clearly. Um, as I talked about a little bit in this example, and then talk a lot about it, but there was that pile of eight objectives yeah. that people cared about. And to, uh, yes. Sure. I don't know if I'll come out on the recording here, but one thing that I like to do when approaching these things is treat uncertainty as a representation of how much knowledge we have. And so as we're building these models and we don't have the information from other parts, other experts, to still recognize as analysts that we, we you know, have to identify this variable and we can encode a probability distribution that reflects my level of knowledge Right. Uh, so sometimes they're not material. So, um, you know, knowing the sort of preferences for fish productivity to me it's not that important. You know, let's just find out how much people care about that. But right. that and, and actually this this chart kind of illustrates that in some degree. So so we have this list of variables and we don't really know what their value should be. So we vary them from a low value to a high value and see if it makes a difference. And we've ordered them so that the one that has the biggest effect is at the top, the compliance weight. Compliance weight means how important do you think it is to comply with the legal requirement to re that says the, the oil rig leaseholders have to remove them at the end of their life completely and restore the ocean to its pristine state. 
And so, and the other ones, you know, there are various other objectives. And people have different opinions about this. These are really value judgments. And, but the th interesting thing is, so, so that vertical black line is at zero. And it, if we have a positive utility difference, it means we favor partial removal. If we have a negative value, we prefer complete removal. And if you have a high weight on compliance, then uh, you can see that it could, the total value could go negative. In other words, you, if, you, if you really think complying with that uh, lease agreement is critical, then yeah, you do want to do complete removal. But for all of the other parameters, if you just take them one at a time, none of them is sufficient to change the decision. So even though there's a lot of disagreement and uncertainty, in this case, they don't matter. So what this really simplifies the analysis, because what it means is that going forward, we really could just focus on compliance and how people felt about that. And the other issues, even though there were disagreements, and some of them were uncertainties, you know, it wasn't really going to change the decision. So by doing this kind of sensitivity analysis, it can, you know, it tells you what to focus on, compliance in this case, and it tells you what you don't need to worry about, even though you might be uncertain about. So it can be extremely valuable. And um, here's another example from the um, vehicle case, the A-team. So in this case, um, we have a heap of variables there. It doesn't matter if you can't read them necessarily. Um, these are uncertain estimates that go into the model projecting, we're trying to project electric vehicle sales share in 2021. This was done a few years ago, um, although even like one year ahead is actually kind of challenging, but five years is very challenging. But we will look at the model projects how many people will buy electric vehicles based on a model of consumer preference that includes costs and convenience and availability and so on. The main point here, and so the horizontal scale is the electric vehicle sales share. And the main point is the top variable there is the price of oil. And so it turns out that the price of oil, if it went to the higher end, the possible price, uh, you know, could have a dramatic effect on EV adoption. Yes? Can I ask something? I don't get why the different columns. For example, first line, no? the oil price, oil price has yes. huge influence on the projected sale of oil. Right. right. That's obvious, no? Yes. Um, yeah, I would say the red and the blue. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so the, the red in this case is if that quantity is at low end, and blue is if it's at the high end. So if oil price is low, then PV sales will be, EV sales will be low. If it's high, they'll be high. For some of the other parameters, it goes the other way. So for example, the unit battery cost multiplier, which is about a third of the way down, you know, the higher the battery cost, the lower the EV sales, as you might expect. But, but the key point here is that, so predicting the price of oil is notoriously intractable. I mean, you know, it's been pretty low for the last few years. There was a spike you know, when th we thought there might be a war in Iran. Um, or, you know, and you know, it could still could happen before the election, perhaps. And the you know, price of oil might go up to $150 a barrel. That would be dreadful, but it would be good for EV sales. But you know, we don't know. But the point here is that um, because if you want to, if your main goal is to get a better estimate of the future EV sales, you are going to be pretty limited by the 
fact that you can't predict the price of oil very well. And therefore, there's not a whole lot of value in developing a way more detailed model of all the other pieces. I mean, this is already a somewhat detailed model. Um, but bec even though we might be able to get better estimates for some of these other quantities if we put more effort into it, found more data, the, if the main thing we care about is EV adoption rates, then uh, you know, it's going to be of limited value getting better estimates of those other quantities given that we're not going to be able to get better estimates of the price of oil. So again, I mean, it's a negative and a positive message. I mean, negative, well, there's a limit to how accurately we're going to predict, be able to predict this. Positive for us as modelers, well, this is about as good as we can do, and anyone who's going to do better is going to be wasting that time. Right. Yes? But at least it can help me building an optimal portfolio, because you know that <laughs> they are going in optimal. Yes. That's, that's absolutely right. I mean, for some people, this might be really interesting. You know, might be a good idea to hedge, on, you know, m maybe buy some EV shares and some oil shares, or, you know, might be something more sophisticated. But the uncertainty could be, and the volatility could be very interesting for some people. Yes? Mm -hmm. say, well, you have to turn it into dollars or something. How, how did you manage to do that with the chart with the previous one that had utility? Um, well, that's a great question. And you obviously understand how this stuff works. So, so I, I'm not going to say too much about it cause, just because of the lack of time. But um, so, so, you know, there are eight objectives that we put together here. And there's a multi-attribute decision analysis is sort of all about how do you combine those different objectives. And you know, each person may have different weights on them. And actually, you know, what weights mean is an important thing in itself. Um, and I mean, it sounds like you know this. There are ways of doing that. Now, Ron Howard in the Stanford School of Decision Analysis basically say, well, let's reduce everything to dollars. And so, um, you know, let's start out with what's the cost of decommissioning. And then, okay, if we care about the impact on marine mammals, the sea lions, then we ask questions about, okay, well, suppose, you know, 100 sea lions would get hurt by removing these things in this way, you know, how, mu how many dollars would that be worth to you? So you can play that game, and I certainly do on occasion, but the cool thing about this analysis is that it actually means you can get results without spending a lot of time on that, which those are difficult games, you know, and it's difficult to get people. You can get people to talk about, you know, dollar values for these qu qualitative objectives. But in this case, we didn't really need to. The only thing we needed to care about was how much people worried about compliance. And compliance is kind of an odd thing, because in a certain way, it's, there's a law. It had to be changed, and it actually was changed in the end, to allow the oil companies to leave the platforms in place, or the bottom part, take off the top platform. And. Um, but some of, there were still some people, especially in some of the environmental groups, that felt like, well, it's not right to let the oil companies you know, sign a lease saying they're going to reduce, remove the platforms, and then let them off the hook, even if, as you'll see, if it kind of had some good benefits. So let me come move on to that. So this is just kind of a summary of what I'm talking about, agile analytics. So. Um, you know, using influence diagrams to clarify the objectives, to kind of structure them with your clients. Start with a simple prototype. Cycle, iterate, test, um, and, and so on. I'm going to just 
finish up here talking about visualizing and communicating results. Actually, I'm not going to talk about visualization in terms of designing beautiful charts and maps and so on. Not because I don't think that's fascinating and interesting, but I think that many of you have heard that and other people can speak about that better. I'm going to make a couple of particular points here. So, well, this is kind of a cute cartoon. Um, and indeed, in this um, <coughs> platform decommissioning study, we did put together a 300-page report and handed it over to the stakeholders. And indeed, one of them said to me, couldn't you just you know, summarize it in one page? And I was like, that's irritating. And then I thought, well, actually, he's right. You know, we should do that. And so kind of this is that one page, essentially. So we, we really, after the analysis, realized there's only two meaningful options, you know, full removal or partial removal, essentially rigs to reefs, leave the bottom part as an artificial reef, which it turns out is good for the environment because there's all this marine life that's living on these. And the only bad thing, real, and it saves a lot of money because it costs a billion dollars to remove all 27 platforms completely and maybe half a billion just to remove the top. So it saves half a billion dollars. The only thing is that some of the environmentalists couldn't quite get behind saving the oil companies half a billion dollars. So, um, so there was another wrinkle on this, which is to split the savings. Half of it goes to the operators, and the other half goes to a fund for marine conservation. And with that, everybody comes out ahead. And you know, we, it ended up with uh, legislation going through the California legislature and our uh, <coughs> governor, but, but two back, uh, Schwarzenegger signed it into, into law as one of his last things that he did. So, and you know, getting consensus on an issue of energy and environment is not a common thing especially in the California legislature. So the last point about communication I wanted to say was, yes, it's great to have cool graphics, no argument. But what is really great is if you can have a model that your clients, your stakeholders can play with and you know, twist the dials and see what happens. Because you get a kind of understanding, a kind of visceral insight that you can't get just by hearing, you know, my PowerPoint or whatever. And so, sorry, it's these same guys here, but anyway. Um, so, so now, if you have a model that does, in fact, take a cluster of computers to run for several weeks, then obviously it's not very interactive. But even in that case, you can usually take the results from a bunch of different scenarios and make an interactive version from those results. And then it turns out that playing with that is you know, really a great way to communicate things. So this is kind of my summary of what I've been saying. So, well, first of all, you know, I don't, engaging with clients isn't gonna, isn't the only thing that you need to do to be successful, but I think it is perhaps one of the most important, if not the most important thing for many of us who have already mastered the kind of the technical skills for, for doing analytics. And you know, ask questions and listen. Help clarify our clients' decisions and objectives and certainties, sitting down with them, drawing up influence diagrams. Use agile methods to refine the model and refine it, driven by sensitivity analysis. And you know, finally, if you can, have a tool, have a model that your clients can interact with. So um, final point, really just reiterating it. The success of your analytics 
depends on the quality of your engagement with your client at least as much as on its technical quality. And the good news is, you know, we can learn this stuff. It took me a while, um, but, you know, it became interesting and valuable. And I think, if, you know, for those of you that already do it, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you that haven't so much, I'm sure you would get into it but once you realize, once, especially once you realize that your satisfaction as an analyst, as a data scientist, really, I mean, we probably got into it for various reasons, but, you know, I'm assuming, you know, we like software, we like numbers, we like math in varying combinations. And, but ultimately we're doing this because it makes a difference in the world. It's helping people make better decisions. It's helping improve our world. And, you know, if you're like me and that's kind of ultimately what drives you, then, you know, this is really kind of an important point. Thank you. Okay. We have five minutes only. I'm sorry I went on a little bit long, but let's see. We had some questions as we went, so that was good. Does anybody, yes? Applied science fiction. You want to see the? I want to see that baby walk. That baby walk, absolutely. And what what is walking really entail? Getting deployed, getting used. Getting deployed, getting used. Absolutely. Thanks. Anybody else? What is it like if, for somebody to work a boom and a half manager? <laughs> well, we'll say that later. We we are hiring, by the way. If anyone is interested in working with us, that's Lottie's point. Yes. You need a subject matter expert as well as a technical expert. I mean, the other thing I want to say is, I think I didn't say, but which you, you remind me here, is that, um, I mean, there's in schools, in classes, usually they don't, they some, occasionally they teach some of these soft skills, but not a whole lot. There's starting to be more classes in, in universities and so on. And even in some companies training in that area. Um, and you can learn quite a bit through classes and training, but ultimately, you know, you have to do it in practice. Ideally, you want to be working with, uh, you know, a mentor, with somebody with experience, and, you know, see how it actually works out, because, um, you know, there's no substitute for real experience in learning this stuff, but still, you can, you can get started pretty well. And so I think that might be related to what you were saying. Thank you. So in that case, maybe I will, we should adjourn now. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>